OK, so good evening and welcome to the our Ag in the Evening program. My name is Vanessa Corrier Olson. I am the Forage Extension Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension uh, located in Overton. These Ag in the Evening programs are hosted by um, Houston County. Uh, Joe Smith is the County Extension Agent in Houston County and Shaniqua Davis, who is the um, County Extension Agent in Gregg County. Um, we, we do record these events and host them on a YouTube channel. If you are not familiar with how to locate those or the link for those, just let us know and we will get you a link sent. If you have ever received an email from myself or Dr. Jason Banta, that link is typically at the bottom of our email below our signature with our contact information. You can also locate the link for the uh, YouTube channel on my Forge Facts website, which I'll show you a link towards the end of the evening, uh, where you can also find my contact information. You can also reach out to myself, Dr. Jason Banta, Faniqua Davis, or Joe Smith uh, for those links. So <clears throat> we will, like I said, we will be recording. Um, I do request that, um, I think it's easier for all of us, and, and if we all keep our video off, I'll turn mine off shortly and we remain muted um, throughout the presentation so we're not disruptive to other participants. Um, you will have the opportunity um, at the end to ask questions by unmuting. You can also use the chat during the meeting if you want to drop in questions, if you're afraid you're gonna forget um, a question, question that you might have. I'll try to patrol those or watch those during the presentation. If I don't catch one in the middle, I will definitely get to those at the end of the presentations. Um, or at the end of the presentation. All right, so I am going to cut off my video so we don't have any network issues. That's the primary reason for keeping videos off so you can stay connected. I don't have any disruption, hopefully, during the presentation. So um, my topic today is what equipment do you need to make hay? Um, so for a lot of, that is often a common question for folks that may not be in the hay business. Um, or want to get into hay production, whether to market to other livestock producers or to produce their own hay. And then oftentimes, a lot of folks um, just have um, interest in different types of equipment, or there's a lot of questions about, well, what do I really need? Because there are so many different uh, products, of course, out there and different marketing tools and different companies. Um, that have different pieces of equipment that may or may not be advantageous uh, for your particular system. And so we're going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, we are going to talk about equipment today. I am by no means an equipment expert. We will talk about the basics in regards to what you need for hay production. Um, of course, with anything, there are the, um, the you know, more reasonable economical models or versions or setups for hay production. And then there, of course, are also the Cadillac versions. Um, so and that may be dependent on your resources and your interests. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So first I wanna talk about the process of actually making hay, because that process obviously impacts our, our yield, our nutritive value of our hay, and obviously our goal of hay production is to produce a high quality product for our livestock, whether we're feeding it to our own or we're trying to market to other livestock consumers, whether that's cattle or horses. Um, obviously it's very critical if you are trying to market hay to other livestock producers to truly understand your market. Of course, equine owners um, have greater expectations in regards to the value of hay. They are oftentimes more selective on their products. Um, they are very, they may be selective in regards to nutritive value as well as appearance of hay um, compared to many of our beef cattle or cattle producers. Um, so your market will highly depend on a lot of this process or can influence how you process or how you go through the process of making hay. And so that could potentially influence the pieces of equipment or the the scale of equipment that you, you need to have for your particular production system. So one of the biggest factors in hay production is when to harvest, um, when to harvest that hay or, or to harvest that forage. And it's gonna be very species dependent. And once again, it will also be dependent on your market, who you are marketing that product to. Once again, equine owners, um, animals that are very productive, 
they're very active, such as racehorses or um, cows that are calving, animals that are growing are going to have a higher nutrient demand compared to, an, say, a pasture ornament um, or an animal that's not necessarily very active. Um, so, but as far as our forage species, it can be very dependent on that timing of harvesting. Now, for most of us in East Texas, we are harvesting Bermuda grass or other warm season perennials, um, which are primary, a lot of our hay production in Central and East Texas is around Bermuda grass. There are other forage species that can be harvested for hay, some warm season annuals. We can even harvest cool season annuals for hay, um, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But to focus on Bermuda grass, um, so we typically recommend every three to four weeks in regards to harvesting time. And that harvest height could be somewhere from 12 to 15 inches in height. Um, and the reason why we have that three to four week recommendation is that is to optimize not only nutrient value, but also yield. A lot of folks, when we talk about hay production, think more about quantity, the amount of hay they can produce because they're selling it by the bale, not necessarily by the weight of that bale or by the value, nutritive value of that bale. And they're also selling it. They're also thinking about how many bales do I need to get through winter? How many bales do I want to store up for winter or drought conditions? So a lot of people think about quantity much more than nutritive value or quality. And this is some research from the University of Georgia that shows us how delaying that harvesting interval, so how frequently we are harvesting that forage, especially Bermuda grass or any of our grasses. Um, of course, delaying harvest time will increase our yield, but it's going to decrease our crude protein content, and it will also decrease the digestibility of our forages. And um, harvesting time or maturity at harvest is the one thing that influences digestibility of our forages whenever it comes to hay. And digestibility is basically the, the measure of the percentage of those components of that forage that our livestock can digest or convert into weight gain or milk um, or into, a, into a, a product, so to speak. So the higher that digestibility number, whether it's a measure by TDN, total digestible nutrients, or in this case, IVDMD, which is in vitro dry matter digestibility, the higher the number, the more of those nutrients can be utilized by that animal for growth, weight gain, what have you, and less is wasted back into that pasture through their feces and urine. So the higher the number, the better. They're gonna be able to use more of those carbohydrates, sugars, and starches um, for actual agricultural products, so to speak. Um, so that's the, harvesting time has the biggest impact on, on that digestibility component of our forages. Um, fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer is going to directly impact crude protein along with maturity, as you can see on this table on the far right. As our cutting interval expands, the longer we wait to harvest, that crude protein content also declines. So as that plant matures in the field, the nutritive value is going to go down. Um, so it's critical that we time those harvests. Um, the recommendation on Bermuda grass is every three of every three to four weeks to capitalize on nutritive value as well as quantity. So delaying harvest will lead to a decrease in nutritive value. Now, of course, we have to be flexible with that harvesting time because that will be influenced by weather conditions, whether it's drought, so we don't have good growing conditions, or maybe we have a lot of rainfall, and that makes it difficult to cure our hay. And we'll talk about drying time here in a second. Um, and that will likely be critical this this summer, especially now at the beginning of the season, because just about, you know, every couple of days recently in, in parts of Central and East Texas, we've been getting some showers or some rainfall, and that can obviously interrupt our curing process. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So on some other forage species in regards to that harvesting time, um, it can vary. So it's always important when you are selecting a species for hay production, that you understand what's the recommendation, what's the optimum time to harvest that forage for nutritive value and yield. So our warm season annuals such as uh, sorghum sudan grass, sudan grass um, are often used in parts of Texas for grazing as well as hay production. Um, they, are, they are an annual species, so they have to be established by seed. Uh, typically recommend harvesting those warm season annuals about at about a 30 inch height. 
Um, and we do need to make sure that we are leaving at least a six inch stubble when we are harvesting those warm season annuals to allow for regrowth. Now, Bermuda grass, I do recommend leaving a stubble height of at least three inches um, because you do need some leaf area on that plant to initiate regrowth following that cutting event. If you are harvesting or interested in harvesting any cool season forages, such as annual ryegrass or any of our small grains that we utilize for winter forages, those need to be harvested um, pre-boot um, before they are in the boot stage of growth. And so um, that is the boot stage is basically when the seed head is encapsulated. So it has not, the seed head has not fully emerged. So that capitalizes on yield as well as nutritive value because even those annuals, cool season or warm season, as they mature, as they produce those seed heads, um, they will decrease in, in nutritive value, even if they increase in yield. So um, cutting height um, in regards to how much stubble we should leave, Bermuda grass and other warm season perennials such as Bahia grass are typically very forgiving in regards to abuse because their growth point is very close to the soil surface. However, that does not mean that we should scalp the soil surface. So I do recommend throughout the season, leaving a minimal of a three inch stubble height. Now, as we get towards the end of the harvesting season um, or you know, our last hay cutting, I do actually recommend leaving a little bit higher stubble height or allowing for some regrowth before we go into that winter season um, because we do need some leaf area to produce roots um, in order to continue persistence of those forage species. Our warm season annuals, we need to leave a minimum of a six inch stubble height to allow for regrowth. Um, if we scalp those, they're not, they're not going to grow back and weed competition becomes a big challenge at that point with those annual species. So another part of, another process of haymaking is, is drying time. Um, so that is after we have cut, that forage is laying in a windrow um, or in a squat and um, allowing it, how much time does it actually take for that forage to dry? Because bailing that forage at an appropriate moisture content takes, capitalizes on that nutritive value um, as well as reduces the risk of continued loss of nutrients, continued loss of dry matter, and then reduces the risk of potentially having mold or um, heating of those bales to the point that they become combustible. So drying time is critical. And unfortunately, drying time is, is greatly influenced by a lot of things. And a lot of those factors are outside of our, our control. And a lot of that is weather. Um, so typically throughout the Southeast and in Texas, we do tend to have greater drying conditions for our warm season uh, forages as far as hay, because we do tend to have warmer, uh, warmer temperatures and not often as much moisture during the summer. So it's very easy to cure things like Bermuda grass and Bahia grass. They're typically a finer leaf and finer stemmed compared to things like um, say alfalfa, which is has a lot of leaf, um, as well as our warm season annuals. Our warm season annuals have thicker stems and tend to have thicker, more robust leaves, and they can take longer to cure or to dry because of the nature of those plants. So Bermuda grass and Bahia grass can, can dry rather quickly if weather conditions persist appropriately. Um, and so this table shows different environmental and different crop variables that can influence our, our hay drying rate. Um, and so we have our, our variables in the left-hand column from solar radiation, relative humidity, air temperature, swath density and soil moisture content, and then our range, our minimal up to our max, and the curing hours difference between that minimum and max value. So how long it would take to basically dry from that maximum down to a minimal level. Um, so solar radiation obviously has the, has the, is the single biggest factor um, that influences drying of our forages, but obviously that's, that's outside of our radiation. I mean, outside of our control, excuse me. Um, the one factor that we do have control of that does have a pretty big impact on drying time is swath density. So how thick is that windrow? Um, as that forage, obviously in order to dry, that forage needs to have air movement around it, as well as exposure to solar radiation. 
um, and sunlight and air movement to allow that forage to dry. As if you've ever, I'm sure many of you have, have windrowed some cut forage, and obviously what's underneath or in the middle of that windrow takes the longest to dry out because you don't have a lot of air movement at the bottom, um, and then you obviously don't have a lot of solar radiation. So, and as our, as our hay, that hay stays high in moisture content, there's a couple of things that occur um, that plant continues to respire or go through respiration. Um, and respiration is basically the continued use of those nutrients uh, within that plant um, to ultimately to try to produce leaves, what have you. But it continues to respire um, and ex kind of spend those nutrients. And so you can have some loss of those nutrients and some loss of that dry matter content as it stays high in moisture content. Um, so our hay needs to dry down to the point where it's less than 30% than moisture um, for the for respiration to actually drop or decrease or, or actually to stop. So as long as it stays high in moisture content, it can continue to respire um, and kind of burn those nutrients and lead to a loss of that nutritive value for our hay. So, but Bermuda grass, when we have good drying conditions, can dry rather quickly, um, somewhere from 24 to 36 hours. So it can dry rather quickly when we do have good sunlight, we don't have a lot of cloudy days, and, and we have some good air movement um, around that forage. So it can dry rather quickly. Some of our other forages, um, especially our thicker stem, thicker leaf forages, if you've ever try to cure crabgrass that's been in some Bermuda grass. As far as hay, crabgrass will take longer to cure than Bermuda grass because it has a thicker stem and a thicker leaf. So it holds on to that moisture a little bit longer. So our more robust forages, uh, thicker stems, thicker leaves, like our warm season annuals are gonna take longer than say Bermuda grass um, that's very fine leafed and fine stemmed. So um, a couple of other, Things in regards to drying time, of course, another something we have to think about, especially this year with the scattered storms or these pop up showers, we don't know if we're going to get rain or not, um, is that, you know, if we've cut and that hay gets rained on, uh, depending on the moisture content at the time you have that rain event and how much rain you have, unfortunately, that forage can continue to lose some of that can have leaching and loss of some of those soluble carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals. Um, so leaching is typically going to be at the highest when the hay is actually dried somewhat, and then we get prolonged rain. Um, so one of those good long showers, um, good soaking in showers that we're always desiring. Um, if you have a very quick, you know, quick short-lived rainfall, um, it's not necessarily going to be as detrimental as that more long sustained rainfall. Uh, rainfall right after cutting <clears throat> can also will usually result in less leaching. So the closer that that hay is to being dry and then it gets rained on, you're running the risk of losing more of those nutrients, unfortunately. And so obviously that is a lot of that is outside of our our control, but it is something to be aware of and to try to pay attention to weather to the best of our ability as as we think about do we have enough time to get that hay dried? Um, also understanding that it may be, we may not lose as much value um, by delaying that hay cutting versus allowing or running the risk of it being rained on. So it's it's very much a gamble. Um, and unfortunately, there's not, you know, not a perfect answer or a perfect solution to that because there's a lot of factors that, um, a lot of variability um, that can influence or a lot of different factors that can influence that. So the next part of, of haymaking that I want to talk about are the types of bales. Um, probably what's most common, especially for a lot of cattle producers, are round bales um, versus squares, just because of the, the size of those, as well as um, just the, the equipment that we are using. Um, so there can be different pros and cons, and your size, the size of bale you produce will likely depend on your equipment, the size of your equipment, um, the size of your tractor, the size of your baler, um, as well as storage capabilities. And then how are you moving that hay, not only on your own property, but in regards to selling it to other livestock producers. 
Um, so large square bales um, are very popular in parts of the United States, and, and I think there are producers in part of Texas that produce large square bales, um, especially when it comes to producing straw or even harvesting some crop residues. Uh, large squares may be much more uh, common. Um, you see a lot of large squares in states like Montana and, and what have you. Um, so large squares can come in at, at least three different sizes, um, a three by three by eight, a three by four by eight, and a four by four by eight. Um, so this table was taken from a publication um, by Dr. Jason Bantam um, in regards to talking about how important is uh, bale weight and the things that the different things that influence the weight of our bales, how that can influence economics as well as um, moving um, those particular bales. And so that's an excellent publication. I can direct you to it. I think I have it posted on my Forge Facts website. If I don't, I will definitely link it to that. It's an excellent resource talking about bale weight and bale size. Um, and so this table is, is from that, showing you the, um, the estimated weight of those bales based on their size. Um, so that is something that can be very critical in regards to moving hay or transporting hay is knowing the weight um, of those bales in regards to transportation and feasibility and size of equipment that can actually handle those bales. Um, so that's a, an important process or important aspect uh, to think about in regards to uh, producing hay. What form are you going to produce that hay? Does that work within your, your system as well as the market who you are marketing those bales to? So small square bales are um, typically much more popular in the equine arena or for small landowners that are feeding a smaller number of animals that might have minimal equipment. Small squares are obviously easier to maneuver and handle um, by hand as opposed to having needing a um, a big tractor to move those bales. So they are often much more commonly used um, for those smaller landowners or a lot of our, our equine market um, tend to use small squares for, for feeding horses. Um, so that may be, I know of, I've known producers that produce both round bales and square bales um, because they did provide hay and sell hay to different markets. Um, I've also known producers that would bale hay in large round bales and then unroll it to rebale it into squares, into small squares um, for horse owners or what have you. So small squares are also an option, something that can be easily transported um, in a pickup truck, not necessarily requiring a trailer or a lot of heavy equipment potentially. Um, so there may be a market or a need for those uh, small squares in your area. Round bales, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, okay, I, I see there's a question, we'll address that. What markets tend to like the large square bales? Um, so that's that's a good question. Um, I think the, the large squares become, I think the, that's primarily the producers that are harvesting those, uh, those crop residues or that straw. Um, and I, in regards to the, the market that finds those more appealing, uh, I'm not really sure. I think most livestock producers, in my experience, especially cattle, prefer the large round bales um, in regards to moving those bales uh, with, a, with a spear easily. Um, so I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, so my apologies. Um, so as we move on, start talking about equipment. Uh, first and foremost, I am not an equipment expert. Um, oh, oh, great, great. So there is a, David Taylor has responded um, to feedlots and backgrounding yards um, have a appeal for the, or desire for the big, the large square bill. Thank you. <clears throat> so as we talk about equipment, um, something you need to keep in mind as you make decisions on equipment, um, especially whenever it comes to a tractor, selecting the, the appropriate size of tractor and the appropriate horsepower to match your needs um, in regards to the size of baler that you are going to use and potentially other uses for that tractor beyond just baling. Um, you may want to, may also use that tractor for other aspects within your operation, such as herbicide spraying, um, what have you. So 
I do need to keep that in mind unless you do intend to have multiple tractors, which is not necessarily uncommon. Um, so I always recommend visiting with your, your dealer. Um, I realize equipment comes in a lot of different colors, green, blue, red, orange. Um, so there is no um, discrimination here as far as brands or loyalties as far as brands. Um, so um, if you have if you have a particular brand loyalty, that that is that is up to you. I do recommend that you visit with your retailer. They're going to have much more knowledge about the equipment and potential equipment packages. Um, but we're going to go ahead and start. So the basics, as far as equipment, of the basic equipment that is needed um, for hay production is, of course, uh, first and foremost, a tractor, and then a cutter, a rake, and a baler. So the four basic needs will be a tractor, cutter, rake, and then a baler. Um, so if we start with a tractor, tractor horsepower should definitely match your baler and your cutter. Um, and then whether or not, depending on your cutter, whether it's a three-point attachment or a, a pull along or a trail behind, um, that may influence the particular tractor that you select as well. Um, you're, we are looking at 100 horsepower plus in regards to what should what should be uh, or what is recommended for hay production. Um, the other thing to think about is, as far as size of tractor is how many bales do you want to be able to move at a time? Are you going to be moving single bales, whether that's from the field to storage or from the storage to feeding? Or do you want to be able to move multiple bales um, at a single time? Obviously, weight has to be taken into consideration, as does safety. That is something that we need to consider with a lot of this equipment is safety of use. And then um, are you interested in additional hydraulic attachments for different purposes beyond, beyond just baling hay or mowing hay? So cutters or mowers. Um, the two primary different kinds of mowers or cutters are going to be a sickle bar or a um, disc mower. Um, so, so there are mowers, cutters that are just, that, that is all they do. That is all they do is cut. And that could be a sickle bar mower or a disc mower. Um, a sickle bar mower is great for general mowing duties. Um, it can be a three-point attachment or a trail behind. It does have reciprocating actions, very similar to scissors in regards to cutting. It requires very little horsepower, so it's kind of the, the bare minimum as far as a cutter. It's very lightweight. It will allow for um, cutting at angles and ditches, um, so it's good for just general mowing along with mowing for the purpose of hay production. Um, <clears throat> and because there's less motion, there can also be less dust. Um, which when we are harvesting hay, um, cutting and baling hay, we want to minimize the amount of dirt or soil that we might potentially wrap into that bale because that can decrease the value of that hay as well. So pretty simple um, as far as a potential cutter. Um, some disadvantages of a sickle bar, the sickle bar mower's forward speed is it's much slower than a disc mower. Um, they can mow a wide swath, but maximum speeds are only about half of other designs as far as um, how wide of a swath they can cut. There is the risk of clogging. Um, they can become easily clogged when working in very dense forage, um, very thick forage. Blade repair can also be a disadvantage when blades become dull, sharpening or replacing them um, can be time consuming and can also be expensive. Um, so the next cutter would be our disc mowers. In my experience, they are much more common than say a sickle bar. Um, as far as what I see across our state, um, there, it consists of several small discs that rotate at high speeds that are mounted on top of a cutter bar. Um, you can see in this picture, this particular tractor um, has two disc mowers um, behind, at the back and then one in the front. Some advantages, there's less clogging. It, they do easily handle thick um, or potentially lodged hay much better than a sickle bar. You can cut at higher speeds and then ease of transition. Um, hydraulics are often included or part of disc mowers, and so they can easily be lifted to get through gates um, or maneuver around trees, what have you. 
Um, so some some disadvantages or some other aspects of um, of disc mowers, or excuse me, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, another another aspect of cutters are cutters with or mower conditioners. So we can have a a disc with a flow conditioner or a disc mower with a roller um, or roller conditioner. Um, so conditioners help to expedite or, or um, speed up drying time because they basically serve to potentially crimp or break the stem or uh, kind of scratch the stem to allow for, for drying of that forage to speed up. Um, so in regards to the difference between a flail, which is pictured at the very top, um, a flail is, is typically consists of metal or plastic impellers versus the roller type, the roller conditioner C and the lower figure um, creates crimping or inter has intermeshing rolls. So you have two tumblers that have um, different, um, gosh, different grooves in them or, or different levels um, that allows for kind of crushing or crimping those stems as that forage moves through those two rollers. So a flow conditioner will um, typically can, is, is probably is better for grass hay as opposed to, um, or very fine stemmed hay such as Bermuda grass, um, like coastal or otherwise, um, even Tifton 85. So those flails, basically they, they break the vascular tissue or the veins of the plant and the leaves and the stems. Um, so they don't really crush the stem per se, they kind of scratch them, if you wanna think about it in that way. And that allows for that forage to dry a little bit faster. So it'll have faster drying time, especially that first day. Um, uh, so it's this a flail would be best used for grasses, and it, it it's great for Bermuda grass. If you are going to be harvesting some um, stouter forages, such as warm season annuals, uh, maybe even Tifton 85, the roller type um, can save a day or more of drying time, even yeah. over actually over the flail conditioners. So you may want to think about the potential different species that you might be harvesting, weather conditions, um, and these conditioners can help to expedite that drying time. So um, do keep that in mind um, as far as that is probably what's much more common is a mower conditioner, that combination, instead of having them separate. So a disc mower with a flail conditioner or a roller crimper conditioner. Um, so flails are our best for grass haze, the rollers for any larger stemmed forages such as our warm season annuals. If you're potentially going to be harvesting a combination of forages, uh, the rollers might be your best option, whether you're going to be harvesting Bermuda grass and some warm season annuals, or even if you're going to be harvesting some cool season small grains, uh, those rollers could help with expediting um, expediting drying time. Will a roll conditioner be detrimental to Bermuda grass? Um, no, it, it will not. Um, probably the, the one Bermuda grass variety that actually conditioning is very beneficial is Tifton 85. Tifton 85 has a thicker stem than coastal Bermuda grass. And so a lot of people tend to think that it's lower in nutritive value. But with that thicker stem, a roller crimper uh, would actually be beneficial to expedite that drying time. Um, so either a flail or a, ro a roller crimper would be appropriate for Bermuda grass. So I already mentioned a pull type versus a three point. Um, so um, you do have different options. As you can see at the very top is the pull type where you kind of have an arm or sometimes it's referred to as trail behind. This gives you a little bit more flexibility in my opinion, because um, you can move that arm, you can mow to more to the right of you, directly behind you, or more to the left of you. Um, so that gives you some, quote unquote, some more wiggle room and some great more options, whereas the pull type is basically attached to a three-point hitch um, on the back of your tractor. And so you have limited mo mobility you have to, you're basically pulling it um, from one side or directly behind you potentially, you don't have as much flexibility. So those are just different options um, as far as those attachments. 
Um, and so that may be something to, to think about as you are selecting which type, as you are selecting your cutters. Um, of course, technology is always advancing. Um, and this was this was uh, very interesting to learn about. Dr. Jason Banta helped me with this. Um, he stays on a top of a lot of the, the greatest and latest as far as some of the agricultural technology. Um, and this is a self-propelled mower. Um, so it, it looks kind of some, like something out of Star Wars potentially, but um, it's not really a tractor. It's just a self-propelled -propel mower. Um, so you see the mower is in the front. And if you notice the way the wheels are aligned, um, you would ride in the cab, as you can see there, kind of similar to a combine situation. So the mower's in front of you. And the way the wheels are aligned, you never run over the crop. Um, whereas we saw in this previous picture where we had the three disc mowers, one in the front and two in the back, if you're mowing in front of you and then to the sides behind, whatever you're mowing in front, you're running over. Um, so that self-propelled creates an opportunity to to have to not run over that crop. Um, so that's kind of the probably more on the Cadillac version of a, of a cutter, but I did want to, to share that with you. Um, John Deere and other companies are always coming out with new technology um, as far as equipment. And when I was in graduate school, I used to enjoy going to the Sunbelt Expo in Moultrie, Georgia. And they always had different types of equipment, new equipment as far as agriculture, not only for hay production, but also for harvesting things like cotton and, and what have you. So um, just wanted to, to share that. There's some other different Cadillac type uh, pieces of equipment I'll, I'll share with you as well as we go along. So probably one of the, the biggest questions um, is about a tether, um, whether or not I need a tether. So we read a lot about tetting or the purchase of a tether when we read a lot of glossy magazines because in other parts of the U.S., uh, using a tether can be very cr critical to expedite drying time. Um, so what a tether actually does, and here's a, a picture of a tether, um, is it spreads and loosens and kind of turns over loose hay. So it creates an opportunity for um, better solar radiation, exposes to more of that hay that has been that cut forage. Um, that's been at the bottom of the pile kind of brings it towards the top. So you have air movement through that pile as well as better solar radiation. Um, so it creates an opportunity to expedite drying time. Um, so it's typically as far as timing, it's typically done at the start of the second day after mowing um, in order to speed that drying time. Um, so this is not necessarily a critical piece of equipment. It would not be necessary for all hay operations, um, but it, it could be something, it may be something you might want to, to add to your equipment um, if you've had some challenges as far as curing or getting that hay dry. Um, so weather conditions obviously have a great impact on that, um, but this is a, another implement that could be used to help expedite that drying time. We do have to be careful with using something like a tutter um, especially with some of our broadleaf crops, such as alfalfa, um, because one way that we can lose nutritive value is through leaf shatter. And so oftentimes, the more we handle that forage, we can lose more leaf area, and that majority of our nutritive value is in that leaf area. So leaf shatter is another way we can lose value in that process of handling that hay. Um, so we do have to be careful with something like a tutter, especially with things like alfalfa. Um, they try their best to handle it the least amount possible um, so that we can keep all of that leaf on that plant. So rakes, um, this is on one of the must list um, or primary tools list are rakes. And so there are different types of rakes, wheel rakes, as you can see on the left. And then on the far right, um, this is a type of a rotary rake. Um, so there are different styles and types of rotary rakes, but it's basically tines, um, kind of loose hanging tines. Um, they may be in a parallel bar version like we see here, or I have seen some, some rotary rakes that are actually the tines are hanging down in a circular fashion um, and move in a circle as opposed to this parallel bar um, that you see on this picture. So the different wheel rakes are probably well, uh, I used to think they were the most common. Uh, wheel rakes can kind of also be used similar to a tether um, as well. 
um, to kind of break up that swath and expose more of that forage to air movement and sunlight. So wheel rakes are built for speed and productivity. They typically require minimal adjustments. Um, you can have a, you know, a, a single wheel rake, or as you can see, this is kind of a double wheel rake in this particular fashion. And um, if you Google any of these pieces of equipment, you can see all kinds of different manners and um, and styles of these of these different rakes. If you just Google hay rakes or or different rakes for hay production, um, you get quite a, a variation in, in styles and layouts. Um, Wheel rakes can take up a lot of space. Um, they do typically are typically at a lower cost compared to, say, a rotary rake. Um, I'm going to all those R's are going to get to be a lot here in a second. Um, the one advantage to a rotary rake is those tines do not come into contact with the ground. And using a rake, this is where we could potentially add a lot of soil and dust to our hay that can decrease that value. So we once again, we as we cut and as we rake, ted, rake, and bale this forage, we want to have the minimal amount of soil that ends up in that forage. A rotary rake can also handle wet forage as well as dry hay. A wheel rake is gonna do much better on primarily dry hay. So if you have interest in things like baleage, which is harvesting forage at a higher moisture content and then wrapping it, um, that is something else you want to keep in mind as you think about the purchase of some of this equipment, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so think about the different ways or how you might use this equipment, um, and so you don't end up having to buy multiple rakes because you're producing dry hay and baleage. So think about something that will fit both of those needs, and a rotary rake does well with wet or dry forage. Um, comes in a lot of different sizes, a lot of different options. Uh, raking should be done when the hay is dried down to about 35 to 45% moisture. Um, so it's best done on the day of baling, uh, but may need to occur after a, a rain if the hay needs turned over uh, quickly before to allow for some additional drying time, especially if you don't have a tutter. Uh, so raking obviously puts those, puts that forage into a windrow. Um, this is a fancy new contraption by John Deere. It's called a merger. Um, and this was a, a simple uh, picture image. I, I recommend Googling mergers um, for hay production. It's very interesting. So a merger basically combines multiple windrows into a single windrow. So it reduces if your baler has the ability to pick up large masses, you have a larger baler, um, you can very you can merge those windrows and reduce the number of times you're traveling across the field. Um, so there's a lot of technology um, in regards to hay production beyond maybe what many of us are familiar with. But I thought this was a really neat contraption. Um, and there are some other visuals. If you Google a merger, you can see different, um, different sizes of this piece of equipment, and it can merge potentially four wind rows into one. Um, so that can really reduce your number of trips. But that would be, once again, kind of on the Cadillac scale as far as the equipment. So moving on to a baler. Um, so there are a lot of options whenever it comes to balers. Of course, uh, different sizes. There are fixed chamber versus variable chamber balers. Uh, the advantage to a variable chamber is that it's driven by belts and it is expandable, allowing for different bell sizes. Um, and so, and as you select a baler, not only do you want to think about bell size, um, but you may want to think about other aspects of that baler, other things you might want to incorporate. Um, so this is also from that bale weight, how important is it publication by Dr. Banta. Uh, and this shows the effect of bale size on bale weight. Um, so four by four bale versus, you know, a four by five or four by six, you can see. So we have our width and diameter on the far left, and then our estimated bale weight in pounds um, in the middle there in that kind of that middle column. Um, and that is assuming that all bales are the same density as a five by five bale that weighs about 1,100 pounds. So bale size will obviously influence weight. Um, so that will influence the, you know, they'll be critical to match to your tractor and to think about storage, um, especially if you're going to be storing these in a barn. 
um, or some kind of cover to protect them from those weather elements and to, to maintain that nutritive value. And then also think about moving those bales, um, moving them on your own property or up and down the road um, to other to other producers, what have you. So things things that should be considered. Um, something else you might want to think about as far as a baler is um, will that baler handle wet forage or high moisture forage, especially if you have interest in baleage. Um, and we can talk about that um, in a in a second. So another aspect of baling is the the type of wrap. Um, Cecil twine used to be very very popular and, and kind of the common source of kind of string wrap around bales, um, but that has probably decreased with time. It rots very easily, and so and then rats and things like that will often chew on it and and break those if they're stored in a barn. Probably what's more common now is net wrap, like you see on the far left, as well as plastic twine. And it's not going to degrade or, or rot if that if those bales are stored outside. But net wrap is, is definitely much more common in my experience. Um, something that John Deere uh, markets and sells is a wrap called B wrap. Um, not sure if you have heard of B wrap. Um, it came out several years ago and kind of surprised it hasn't reached popularity. Um, or I haven't seen a lot of use of bee wrap in Texas, considering that it helps with um, um, it. It helps in regards to that absorption of, of moisture when that bale um, is in contact with the soil. So it serves as a barrier to prevent that absorption of moisture from the soil, especially if it's stored outside. Um, so that might be something of interest. I don't know what the price differences are between B wrap and net wrap. I'm sure there is a cost difference. But if you're storing your hay outside and that can help reduce some of that value loss. And of course, when that bale comes in contact with the soil, it's going to soak up moisture. So we do lose a lot of dry matter and value out of that bale from the bottom where it is touching the soil. So that B wrap could help to reduce that and help keep uh, more of that that bale intact and that value and that dry matter intact. Um, so that might be something of interest when you're looking at different uh, wraps as far as or ways to to keep that hay together. So I've mentioned baleage a couple of times. Um, so that will be that may be of interest that has increased in interest in the most recent years um, here in East Texas. Um, baleage is baleage or often referred to as haylage. It's harvesting forage at a higher moisture content. So where it's 50 to 60 percent moisture as opposed to less than 20 percent moisture for dry hay. And so it's higher moisture content and then we are wrapping it in plastic um, to create a fermentation process. You're creating an anaerobic environment where there's no oxygen and bacteria basically ferment that forage and kind of keep it in the condition and the value that it is um, within that plastic, as long as that plastic is not disrupted. So there are different, we can do individually wrapped bales or you can um, do inline wrapping. So I've done an entire presentation on baleage. You should be able to find it on our YouTube channel where I go into some more detail of that process. Of, of producing baleage. But if you have interest in baleage along with producing dry hay, um, do keep that in mind when you're selecting balers. There are quote unquote quote, silage balers that have heavier baler, heavier bearings. Um, and they also have scrapers to clear any gummy debris from those moving parts. Because obviously if you are baling very wet forage, it's going to stick to a lot of things within that baler. And there are balers that are, are built and have the capacity to do both dry hay and a wet forage. Um, so that might be of interest. They also have wrapping balers. Um, so this is a baler that then will individually wrap those bales um, for baleage as well. So there are a lot of different models and, and methods of, of doing the baleage, but you can also do an inline wrapper. And, and I'll talk about some of the different equipment needs um, whenever it comes to producing baleage. Whether you do inline or individually wrapped bales will depend on how you intend, to, where you intend to store those bales and how you intend to move them. The individually wrapped bales require a specific piece of equipment called a grabber um, as far as moving those bales without disrupting that plastic. Obviously, if you use a more common hay spear, you're going to create a holes or holes in that plastic, and that leads to deterioration 
of that baleage very quickly. So I do talk about that in my baleage presentation. So if you have more interest or more questions about baleage, I recommend uh, you watch that presentation or you can always ask uh, me any specific questions. Something else, some other um, interesting equipment aspects um, as far as round balers, John Deere has a, an accumulator baler where while you are baling, it can, instead of dropping, uh, having to drop that bale every time and having bales throughout the field, um, it will actually accumulate bales so that you can drop all of the bales at the edge of the field or in a, in a more common, more central location as opposed to scattered throughout the field. So that could be an, an additional, obviously an additional expense, but could make uh, moving, moving those bales a little bit easier and faster. Uh, from one location to the next. Of course, most of us are familiar with the uh, square bale accumulators um, that will that will go through after you've baled your hay or during that baling process will accumulate all those squares um, kind of onto a single piece of equipment that you can drop in kind of these packages, so to speak, throughout the field. And you're not having to go through and pick up each individual bale that's scattered across the field. Um, so a lot of different you know, unique pieces of equipment that can increase efficiency and speed of which we go through that baling process. Um, some other additional things that can be added to balers, uh, moisture meters, there's an NIR moisture meter. Of course, knowing the, you know, that is something critical in regards to hay production is the moisture of which we are baling that forage. And so there are moisture meters that, um, NIR moisture meters that can provide us a reading of the moisture of that bale as we are baling it. So we know whether we should continue baling uh, following that first bale or if we need some additional drying time before we continue to bale. Um, there are also the, the um, ability to add um, hay preservatives. There are, are means of adding additional attachments or balers that come with attachments to apply preservatives whether it's propionic acid or um, uh, other products that can help to preserve that forage if we do happen to be baling it at a little bit higher moisture content. Um, so there are a lot of different hay preservatives. They all have their pros and cons. Um, if you have any questions about those, I'm happy to answer, but those can also be added in that baling process um, as part of that equipment. So there are a lot of different packages, different things that can be added in um, or may be a part of, of some of the newer balers. So a, a lot of different options um, in regards to the, that equipment. So that was kind of a, a rundown of information on just the basics of hay production. I know myself and Dr. Jason Banza have given presentations separately, um, talking much more specifically about nutritive value of hay and forages. Um, Dr. Banta has covered a lot in regards to feeding hay um, and matching that nutritive value to your livestock. So uh, please take advantage of our YouTube channel for some of those additional presentations. You can find that channel on my Forage Facts website under publications. Um, we also, I also post under the events page, any other upcoming Ag in the Evening programs that you might be interested in. Um, we do not have all of our titles for our, our next four upcoming events, um, but we do have those scheduled. So the next Ag in the Evening program will be July 11th. So that will be a Tuesday evening and that will be led by Dr. Jason Banta. Um, we don't have his topic or title as of yet, um, but if you will, pay attention to emails and you can check the events page for Forage Facts. Once we have, excuse me, all of those links and titles, I will be posting that on the Forage Facts website. You can also reach out to Joe Smith in Houston County or Shaniqua Davis in Gregg County or myself or Dr. Jason Banta, and we're happy to provide those links for you um, or that flyer for you with all those additional programs. So with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. Um, that you might have. And thank you guys for attending this evening. Uh, we appreciate your continued participation and support of our programs.